you have your Bibles, turn to Luke uh, chapter 15. We're going to read about the um, prodigal son or the lost son, some might say. Um, but tonight, we want to look at this parable that Jesus tells a little bit closer. And I've preached on this before. You may have heard other people preach on it too. This, this parable of, of, the, of the prodigal son, it's about two sons. It's about two sons. One son went out into the world and did the worldly things. The other son stayed and um, he went through the motions. He did what he was supposed to do, but um, his heart wasn't in it. And he, came, he, he was in a bad place himself. So um, both of the sons were lost or separated from the father in their heart. Um, in Luke 15, it's a, it's, uh, Jesus is talking about um, the joy of finding the lost. He talks about the shepherd will leave the 99 and go after the one. This, this shows you the heart of the father. How many have ever thought that you were the one that the father left the 99 and just, just to find you somewhere? And so, but, but Jesus said, but when the shepherd finds the sheep, he's full of joy. He's full of excitement. And then he says a woman, a woman could have 10 10 gold coins, and she could lose one, and, and, and she'll sweep the whole house, and when she finds it, she'll have a lot of joy also. And so there's joy in being found. There's also joy in being loved as well. And so, but let's pick it up here. Then he goes into the parable of the lost son, or the lost sons, we'll call it. And um, so he's just continuing right down the line, trying to give them some good information. And let's look at uh, verse 10 of Luke 15. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's the truth. I mean, sometimes I think we read the word, not us, but some people might just read the word and just say, oh, we just, um, just breeze over it. Think about what he's saying. He says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's how much God loves people. One sinner. We can't, we can't underestimate the value of one. Sometimes I think people think, well, because I can't reach this many people or that many people, they don't reach anybody. If you could just reach one person tomorrow, and you can get them in the kingdom of God by giving them the word, all heaven will rejoice. You'll be famous in heaven. They'll be talking about you, right? That's what we're here for. We're here to, to win, win souls. Everything else is, is, is part of the process, but, but winning souls is the main thing. It's what the Father wants. That's why Jesus isn't back here yet, because the harvest isn't in. I believe if the harvest was in, he'd already been back here. But until then, we're, we're laborers for the harvest. And so we should be soul-minded or, or conscious about people's lives and, 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 and uh, stay, stay soft and, and pliable towards their condition that they might be in. <clears throat> Some people can get themselves into pretty rough things and they can look pretty rough and, and be pretty mean even. But you have to remember there's a joy in heaven because God loves that person. And so we'll learn to love them too if we have a problem with that. And then Jesus goes into the parable of the lost sons. In verse 11, Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the young son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possession with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this was my, this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. And so we'll stop there and we'll deal with the, the, um, the, the younger son, the one that went out into the world, and we'll spend a little bit of time on him, but the rest of the time is going to be on the one that, that, that stayed, the other, the other lost son, because uh, I'm a pastor, and that's what I do. I talk about, the, <laughs> about those types of conditions, too. And, um, but we can see that uh, the father, it was the father who represents God. Don't forget who, who's telling this parable. It's Jesus, right? What was Jesus doing? What, what was part of Jesus' work? He, he showed the, the disciples and the Jews, Abba, Father. Mercy, kindness, eternal mercy and kindness, unconditional love. He's constantly teaching, teaching them about the, the, the love of the Father. Many of them just only knew things of the law. And because the leadership in the temple wasn't the best and under the old covenant, their idea of God got skewed. They, they just they didn't know God. They didn't understand him, understand his heart. Here Jesus is telling a wonderful story. I mean, we can concentrate on how, how terrible that young man treated his father. I mean, that's what people do, isn't it? They, they, con- they concentrate on the terribleness of what someone has done. I mean, he took all of his, all of his uh, inheritance. In other words, he said, I can't, wait. I can't wait until you die. Go ahead and give it to me now. It's very selfish. And most people would say, well, he's made his, he made his bed, let him lie in it. But not this father, not, this, not Jesus telling this story. It was the father who sat on the porch every day waiting for his son. I could just see him looking over the hills waiting for his son to come back. And when he saw him, he ran to him. How many of you can identify with that, the time that God ran to you and and uh, he forgave you unconditionally and gave you a, a new beginning. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs thirteen fifteen, don't turn there for time's sake, but it says this. It says, the way of the transgressor is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. In other words, when someone's out there sinning and living by the way of the world and, and getting in all that kind of stuff, it should be hard. In fact, you should pray that it is hard because that, that could... Bring them to their senses. But if you have someone that, that, that's why people with a lot of money, a lot of money can go the way of the transgressor and they can cover up the hardness with, with unlimited drugs and alcohol, but they end up in terrible places. But uh, the way of the transgressor is hard. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you remember that road? <laughs> and... Uh, but if you know someone, or if you're praying for someone, especially if it's a young person or an older person, um, if they're on that road of, of the transgressor, um, be careful of the words that you speak over them. Make sure you speak life over them, even though they're acting like a knucklehead, even though they're disappointing you every time you turn around, even though they're doing things that they, they shouldn't do. Speak life. Speak God's word over them. And be a blessing to them. Don't curse them with your words. Amen. This is what the, the Lord put in my heart this evening to say, because I think too many people, they get upset and they get frustrated with someone that they've been praying for, and, and they don't watch their words. Your words must line up with what you're believing for. Always. Always. You can't let your guard down on that. Your faith won't go any higher than your confession. You can't pray one minute with a confession and then the next minute meet someone at Walmart and they ask you how so-and-so is and you run them down into the ground. Well, 
That's not how we're called to be. And we're to, to look at the love of the Father. The love of the Father is unconditional. And we should start to see the time and believe that one day this person or people that we're praying for, they'll, they'll come home to the family of God. And, they'll, and you will, and all of heaven will rejoice and sing over that person. Just think about that. One person, when one person turns it around, heaven rejoices. Sometimes when a person turns it around in a church, not this church, but some churches, hardly anybody rejoices. But all heaven rejoices. We're to be connected with heaven. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit because that sort of goes with the, uh, the other son, how, how he didn't guard his heart. But, so that's pretty much it for, for the younger son. We know that he did receive some tender love and mercy. And uh, know this about forgiveness. Forgiveness truly does forget and is willing to start over with a new beginning. Let me say that again. True forgiveness will forget and is willing to start over with a new beginning. Have you ever had someone tell you, I, I forgive them, but let me tell you what they did? I get that a lot as a pastor. And, and I think, you didn't forgive them because you wouldn't be talking about it. Uh-oh, I'll move on. But if we truly, truly, truly forgive, we, we, we don't talk about it, we forget. Just forget it, let it go. Say, how can, I, how can I do that? God will help you do that if you put your heart to it. Because that's what the Word says to do. And there's power and there's grace in that. And so, but we have to understand that um, that's what God wants us to do. Sometimes we hold on to things too long. Or am I the only one? We hold on to anger. We hold on to disappointment. We hold on to fear sometimes. We hold on to all types of things. It reminds me of a story. I heard, uh, heard of a woman that she was... Uh, she lived out in the country, and she was doing the dishes at the, at the sink, and she was looking out the window, and she had four little kids. And, she, and they were out playing by the wood pile. And, and uh, they were playing with the baby skunk. <laughs> and she got flustered. And, and she yells out the window in a panic, run, kids, run. Well, don't you know they picked that skunk up and started running. <laughs> I can contribute that to Charles Capps told it. I was listening to one of his CDs the other day. And uh, his, C his CDs are good to listen to because you can get some good, good stories back there. But, but isn't that what we do sometimes? We pick the problem up and run with it. I think she meant leave the skunk alone and run from it. <laughs> and, uh, um, but we've got to be careful we don't do that. We've we got to be careful that we, that we are diligent to keep our lives, lives stress-free. And um, God will help us with that. And so let's look at um, verse 24 through 32. He says, For this was my son, dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Now the father, he's... It's static. He's to the moon and back. He's having a big party, right? But look at verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard the music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come home. And because he has Received him safe and sound. Your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. And so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, he couldn't even say my brother, he's this, this son of yours. 
As soon as this son of yours comes, hold the second one, lost my spot. As soon as, verse 30, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. See how the, the older brother wanted to bring up the past. He wanted to bring up the sin. The father wanted to rejoice about a new beginning. Look at verse 31. And he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. And so the, the son that stayed home, he was just as lost, wasn't he? He was, he was living in his father's house, but he did not have the heart of his father. The whole point of us being a believer is to be like the father, to be Christ-like or to be like the father. We are to have the heart of the father. And if you ever wondered what the father's heart was like in these situations, you can see it right here. He's happy. He's glad when someone turns it around. I'm glad that the father didn't use my past against me. You know, the older son did what was expected of him, but he did, he did one thing that he, he didn't do one thing. He didn't guard his heart. A lot of God's children are in this kind of condition. A lot of children are, people, God's children are like that. We're always children no matter how old we are, right? In your marriage, in your church, or in your workplace. Look at Matthew 15:8. God has lots of lost children who go through the motions, but their heart isn't in it. That can be turned around. Same way the, the, the younger son turned it around. He was in a pig pen. But, but if we find ourselves in that condition, we can come to our senses too. Sometimes it takes a word. Sometimes it takes a word, a Holy Spirit word to, to prompt our heart. I pray that, if, that this, this word can move your heart. Because if the word can't move your heart, then, you're, then you, you should worry. Amen? And, uh, but we need messages to um, prick our spirit, just to, just to move us a little bit. To, you know, we need to hear things sometimes that we need to hear, not what we want to hear. We could spend all night telling you how you can get a brand new car by faith. And, uh, but, you know, these are the messages, I think, that really matter. In Matthew 15, 8, Jesus is quoting an Old Testament scripture that the Father said. He says, these people, these people draw near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You see, the Father knows the heart, doesn't he? He knows the heart of each and every one of us. So in other words, and today they're singing and praising and they're worshiping the Lord and they're going through the motion, but their heart's not in it. God notices those things. Why? He loves you. What does he want from you? He wants you to love him back. He wants you to have the heart of the Father. Why else would the Bible say that the love of God's been shed abroad in our hearts? We're capable of tremendous love, probably more than we've all been given out. We are so, you can't tap, you can't exhaust the love of God that's in you. The love of God is in you. You even surprise yourself sometimes, but you have to know that it's there and you have to um, condition yourself to believe and to keep, keep watching over your heart and make sure you don't get hardened over certain things. Because you can. It can happen to anybody. It's, it can happen to me. It's, in fact, it does happen to us where we're presented with the opportunity to have a heart and heart. I remember uh, some years ago, there was a lady that wanted some uh, food over at the food pantry. And this was before Sister Alma came, came on board there. or well, She started it, but then there was a little bit of time in between there. And, and, uh, um, but, you know, she came all the time. And you can sort of understand sometimes where uh, sometimes you, you start, I, I just, can I just be, be honest? Sometimes you start to think, am I being taken advantage of? Are we being taken advantage of? Or, or things. And, um, and so that particular evening, I must have had a bad day. I told Leslie, I said, you're going over. You'll meet her over there. 
She said, I ain't going over. You go over. <laughs> and so, and so, I was like, we'll both go over. Now, she, she just didn't want to go over by herself. I don't think her heart was like mine in that. I, my heart was getting a little bit sketchy. And uh, so we just decided we both would go over. And uh, we went over, and um, we're helping her put some food in the bags as, pretty much as quick as we can. And all of a sudden, I heard the Holy Spirit down into my spirit. And he said, stop a minute and look at her. Just stop and look at her. And I stopped, and I looked at this woman, and, my, and that hardness just started to melt away. And I began to see a troubled woman. I began to see someone that, that really needed loved, not criticized, and not um, um, uh, whisked away real quick. And so I just stopped it right there, and I said, let's pray. Let's pray right now. We want to pray for you. This woman was suffering with some very bad things. And... Um, when we prayed in that little food pantry, I, I, I felt the, the Holy Spirit my whole entire life, but it has never been stronger than it was over there that day. That whole food pantry filled up with the presence of the Lord. And we could minister to her. And uh, um, so it happens. I'm just being transparent, right? Now, I've grown a lot since then, but how quick can that be if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit? And if you don't if you don't just take um, uh, time and pause to, to um, examine your conduct, you can be in a very bad place. Um, look at uh, Matthew twenty four twelve, And this woman is still, she's still uh, doing well today. This was years ago. This is way, way back. And, and I will tell you from that moment forward, so you don't lose all confidence in me because I'm well, being transparent, I have not had one of those experiences as far as that goes before, you know, in those areas, because the Lord corrected me. I'm glad that he corrected me. The Bible says only a fool despises correction. Um, uh, you know, he, he'll speak into your heart. You can over, either override it. Your conscience is, is, is a safe guide. But, uh, um, but we can see in the older son, he just, um, I mean, I think he would have preferred that the younger son stayed out with the swine. His own blood. I mean, that's pretty harsh. Rather than see him come in and get healed up and get nurtured back to health. And, and uh, um, Jesus is telling this story for, for a purpose. In the beginning, he says the father has two sons. The father had two sons. So he's letting you know he's going to talk about two sons. But over the years, people only ever talk about the one son. Now this son, too, needs to, needs to be dealt with as well. Look at Matthew 24, 12. It says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of, of many shall wax cold. The love will wax cold. One translation says, evil will spread and cause many people to stop loving others. I want to look at this scripture again. Look, it says, because iniquity or because sinful thoughts or sinful ways and, and worldly, worldly things that keep coming into our life, it, it'll abound that the love among, of many will wax cold. Now, he didn't say that, that, that the people would be hateful people. He just said their love would wax cold. I believe more of them won't be hateful, but they'll be indifferent indifferent to suffering humanity, indifferent to these sorts of things that we are to be very, very much involved in, in loving. Do you see that? Does it say, look at this again, because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Does it say that, that in the waxing of cold that there'll be mean, hateful people? They're going to be out there. But usually in the church, Sometimes that's there, but predominantly, it's, it's indifference. It's going through the motions over and over again and, and not guarding your heart like the, like the older son and then having trouble. How many know that that could happen in the marriage? You have to fight for your marriage. 
because the devil doesn't like marriages. There was this um, couple, this newly, newlywed couple in love, and uh, the, uh, the husband drove a pickup truck with one of those bench seats in front, the bench seats. I don't, nowadays they have bucket seats, but this is an older truck. And so you could see them driving down through town, and, and the wife would be right up against her husband. You know, you ever see those pictures? You see this just right up against him, and uh, just want to, couldn't get any closer to him. He's driving down through town with his woman by his side. You know, everybody can see in town, see they're in so much love. And then a couple years later, they're that same couple, same trucks driving downtown, and the woman's clear over by the door. And she gets to thinking about it, and she says, as they're driving through town, she says, she says, what happened? She says to her husband, she said, what happened to us? And he said, you moved, I didn't. Amen? So we got to be careful, where are we moving to? All those things matter, right? All those things do. We have a God that wants us to be in love with our spouse. You know, we're talking about, um, I'll just get, I mean, I'll just get a little in, in depth here because I'll just follow leading of the Holy Spirit. Um, sometimes I hear people, the spouse will say, I love my, my spouse, but I'm not in love with them anymore. Well, what happened? Somebody waxed cold. If you're in love with them in the beginning, now barring any terrible type, abuse types things, but, but if you're in love in the beginning, what happened to your love now? And, and it's, a, it's a hurtful, painful thing for me to hear a, a spouse say that that, that, that I love them or I love her, but I'm not in love. God wants us to stay in love. Amen. How do you stay in love? How do you keep the love keep flowing up? What do you do if your love is waxed cold? Start saying what you said in the beginning. Use your words. Start giving compliments. Start heaping high praise and, and, and speak the love in a tender way that you did in the beginning and that, that fire will, will come back. Because probably it's, it's the words that got got you in the position that you are now because sometimes couples forget who they're talking to. They forget who they're talking to. We got enough problems in this world without beating each other up in the home. Not physically, but mentally. There is such thing as, as verbal abuse. Amen. And, and um, these, these types of things that, that can, can uh, uh, make us uh, cold in our heart towards one another. That's not God's will for us, is it? So I want to read to you Hebrews 6, uh, 10 through 12. This is going to be out of the New Living Translation, if you want to follow along in that. I've read this the other night, and, um, or the other day at, at the, at the uh, sermon I was given. It says, for, for God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have so shown your love to him by caring for other believers, as you still do. Our great desire is that you will keep on loving others as long as life lasts in order to make certain that what you hope for will come true. Then you will not become spiritually dull and indifferent. Instead, you will follow the example of those who are going to inherit God's promises because of their faith and endurance. And so as we love each other and as we help each other in our home, in our church, it keeps us from being spiritually dull and indifferent. Look at Proverbs 4.33. You know, I was talking about couples. Sometimes we, for, we can forget the words that we speak to our spouse. Um, 
one day I was watching uh, Oral Roberts on TV. He was giving an interview, and his wife was sitting right beside him. And she didn't do much speaking. He did most of the speaking. But she must have wanted to interject something, and, and uh, he sort of got a little snippy with her. And, um, I mean, I saw it. It was right there. And I remember thinking, whoa, he, he wasn't too, too kind. About 10 seconds later, he stopped. He said, excuse me, I forgot who I was talking to. Sometimes in relationships, we forget who we're talking to. Amen? We need to remember um, love and honor and respect and those things and, and caring for one another so we're not indifferent or spiritually dull. As a pastor, when I run across spiritually dull and indifferent people, it, it, it's bothersome. And I'll be honest, they all don't recover from that. Some will go to the grave like that. They will. Some do recover. But let's just do what the Word of God says so we don't get there. And if you feel that, that you have become indifferent or dull or a little bit, I just feel leading towards the marriages especially, get that right. Amen? Say, say, about your spouse what you said in the beginning and show them that kind of love and, and you'll rekindle the flame. Look at Proverbs 4.33. He says, keep. What's that? Oh, 23, 23. Is it? Let me check that. I did change that, but then I printed out my sermon again and forgot to make the change again. Let me make sure it's 23. Yeah, okay. Thank you, sweetie. Proverbs 4.23, keep, which means guard, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Now, whose job is it to guard your heart? Your, your job. I found that a lot of times in, in relationships, um, the other person is so, so worried about what they want to say and what the, what's happening to them, they don't, they don't listen to each other. And, and they're, not, they're not guarding their heart. When your spouse speaks, you should listen. Because it's important. Amen? It means the world to them. When, when they know you're listening. And uh, you don't always have to be right all the time. The Bible says love does not insist on its own way. That scripture hits me every time I try to insist on my own way. And, and uh, um, not everything matters. Whatever happened to picking and choosing your battles? <laughs> and, and, uh, but we have to be careful about things like that. So how do you guard your heart? We'll talk about that a little bit here. The first thing you do is be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Look at 2 Corinthians 10.5. You got people say, don't tell me how to think. Well, the Bible tells you how to think, right? Did you ever hear, uh, they say the world is brainwashing people? Well, we're supposed to be brainwashing people in here. But we're washing them with the word of God. Your brain's going to get washed one way or the other. Let's, why don't well wash it with the word? And, and just let the word just, get, just, just flush that stinking thinking. Drop the skunk and, 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 and just, you know, just think about good things. Isn't that what Paul said in Philippians? What sort of things are good and just and honest of a good report? Think on these things. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You need to take the thoughts captive. You can't say, Pastor John, I need you to follow me around. When I get these thoughts, I need you to cast them down. I got my own thoughts to deal with. Right? Preacher or not preacher, we all got the thoughts. Brother Hagin used to say, thoughts are like this. You can't keep the birds from flying over your head. 
but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. And so thoughts are everywhere because that's how the devil works. Thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Hardened hearts start with thoughts. Wrong thoughts. A heart that is, is, is spiritually alive and on fire for God has the godly thoughts that they, that they um, have going on. You will go in whichever direction you're thinking. That's the way we're built. So we've got to be thinking about the word. It's like someone driving down the road. Some people, you don't want to say, look at that barn over there because they drive in the area that they're, that they're looking, right? And so you just don't tell them anything about the side of the road. And, uh, but the, the way you're thinking and the way that you're continually putting in is, is the way your life is going to go. And, uh, but see how it says cast down, thought, down imaginations? Every high thing that exalts itself against the word of God or the knowledge of God. Bring it into captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. There's some power words in there. Casting down? I mean, to cast something down, you've got to exert some kind of effort here, right? Cast it down. Look at this. Um, bring every, every, every thought into captivity. Take it captive and make it be obedient. Make your thought life be obedient to what the Word of God says. Now, if you're listening to the Word all the time, it's going to be easier. If you're not listening to the Word and you're out in the world and doing around the wrong types of people, the wrong types of things, I don't even think you can do it because you're just flooding your mind too much. When you become a believer, you, there's, some, there's just some things you should just separate from and just say, you know what, that, that was the old me. I'm taking off the old man and putting on the new man, as the Bible says. Because those ways aren't, aren't good for us in any way. Look at Hebrews 4.12. So we're talking about how do you guard your heart. The first way you do is be careful how you think. And you know what? In your marriages, you can help your husband or your wife if they start. You can know if they're, if they're thinking wrong because they're going to be speaking wrong. And you can help them. And if you see that they're struggling and they're speaking wrong and they're getting a little bit irritable and they're not acting quite right, don't jump on them. And, and I, Leslie and I call it, say it like this, don't take it on the chin. Not physical punch, but sometimes you just got to not jump back at them and get in some kind of uh, cat fight. You just have to say, okay, they're having a tough day. They're having a tough time. I'm going to be the positive um, one in this. And I'm going to show them the love of God. Because the Bible does say a soft answer turns away wrath. But Hebrews 4.12, this is a good news translation. I like this, um, this translation. It says, the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where the soul and the spirit meet, to where the joints and, and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of the heart. Look how powerful the Word of God is. It's the only thing that can divide the soul and the spirit. They're that close. They're that connected. The way you think and the way you imagine out here in your physical realm and in your soul, but then you have a, a, a born-again you in your spirit, man, in, your, in the heart, man, or the heart of the woman, that thinks different. It's your conscience. It's your, it's your safe God. I'll give you an example. If someone makes you angry, no one in here gets angry, right? The Bible does say you can be angry and sin not. If someone makes you angry and you're dealing with this anger, but you don't like the anger, you don't like how it makes you feel, because down inside of you, you know it's not pleasing to God, you know it's not how we're to be. Down in here, right? You got a battle going on, you got a battle. But prayerfully, you've hid the word of God in your heart. And the Holy Spirit will come and help you and, and bring to you the words of life so that you don't start speaking words of death. That's how you guard your heart. If, if you just say whatever comes to your mind and keep saying whatever comes to your mind, you're not guarding your heart. Your heart can be hardened by that. We count on the word of God, don't we? Your conscience is a safe guide when the word of God is your treasure. 
Let me say that again. Your conscience is a safe guide when the word of God is your treasure. When you know what the word says. You know how many people are in jail today? They wish they had five seconds to back over. They wish they would have had just five. And they're good people too. They're not bad people at all. But, but they did something in five to ten seconds. And, and they wish they would have had it over. We've got to learn to, to, you know how the Bible says be quick? James 1.19 says be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. I believe that also means be quick to listen when it says that. Be quick to listen to your own heart. Be quick to listen to the greater one inside of you. Be quick to listen. Be, be ready, be on guard. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry so that you don't uh, go out and, and, and do things that you're going to be sorry for. I remember when I worked for the tree service, I've told this story before, but some of you haven't heard it. Um, but was, this is back when I was a single parent with four children, and all the kids went over to Magic Years. And uh, I work a full-time job trying to um, take care of four children. I could still see the laundry pile down in the basement. But I digress. But anyway, and uh, um, I was flying one day over to, at the Chambersburg dump. You, know, you have to go across the bridge down there, um, down that way, and, and uh, where the water treatment plant is. And I, I was moving pretty good, and I seen these guys off to the side. They were painting this big pipe. That's back when they redid the whole water treatment center plant. And they were painting it, but I, 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 didn't, I just didn't register to me that I was going to kick up a lot of dust. And I did, because when I looked in the mirror, it was nothing but a dust cloud. I was flying through there because it's dusty up there. But I did, you know, I had to get back to Magic Gears by like five, or else they charge you like some crazy amount every every five minutes or late or something. And and uh, um, so I, I I dumped the truck and I came back down through. Well, guess what? Them boys were waiting on me. They blocked the road. And, you know, back in that day, I was a little bit more buffer than I am now, you know. But, you know, testosterone and things. I didn't let some painter, um, never mind. <laughs> so I'm driving back down. I'm like, and I had a partner with me, but he didn't like conflict in any way, so he wasn't no good. But anyway, and uh, I'm driving down. And I was like, oh, they blocked the road. But, but it, was, it was sort of dumb because I could drive. I just drove right out around it. But anyway. Drove around it, and, and I was heading out. Everything was going to be fine until I looked in my rear view mirror. And the guy's like, he's like waving me back and, and doing all kinds of things. I, I don't know what happened to me. My flat, I just slammed on the brakes. I stopped. And he wasn't afraid. I was like twice his size, too, but he wasn't afraid. <laughs> he came right up to the door, and, and I, was, I thought we were going to fight right there. But then all of a sudden, inside of me, I felt this, this, uh, this presence of the Holy Spirit. And he's like, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I mean, sometimes it takes more of a man to walk away than it does to stand there and fight. And then I started thinking about my kids. And they need me. They don't need me in jail. <laughs> and and, uh, and so I said, I said, you know what? I said, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I put the dust out there. I humbled myself. I said, I didn't really see that you were doing that. And it shocked him. And he stepped back and he said, okay, all right. And that was it. We could have been fighting, and it might not have been good. Because there was like three or four of them guys, and my partner don't like conflict. But anyway, but we're in those positions almost every day, aren't we? Do I need to talk about road rage? No, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> he does <just> said, yeah. <laughs> How many times, like, like, like someone beeps a horn at you or does a certain thing, and, and uh, how many forget that you're a Christian for a while? And uh, don't raise your hand. And uh, we need to be Christian 24-7. And we need to just listen. Be quick to listen, right? 
I guarantee you, when you're in any situation, the Holy Spirit will speak to you. And if you have, let me say that again, your conscience is a safe guide when the Word of God is, it, is your treasure. Because that's where the Word's supposed to be. It's supposed to be hid in your heart. Now, what, what worries me sometimes is Christians who have bad behavior, anger, cause strife, all these types of things, and, and they don't feel bad about it. They just, that's sort of something that, um, that's a bad place to be. Because the Word of God says, don't do those things. Some years ago, there was uh, um, two, this was a long time ago, two ladies in the church that had a Facebook war. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what my life consists of as pastors. Putting out men defenses, putting out the fires. Why? Because I want to see people get healed. And there's nobody getting healed if it's the Hatfields and McCoys in here fight with each other. And uh, uh, there's some Facebook thing, so I went and talked to the one I thought was more easier. And, I, and, and she said, yeah, it's fine. I didn't mean anything by it. It's how, it's how it usually starts. I just, it just, I put a comment, she put a comment, and then, they, then I put a comment. You know how that goes before you know it? Everybody in the world sees this drama. And, and, um, but they're church members. <laughs> Sisterly love, right? <laughs> and, uh, um, but I went to the other one, and, and I, I said, you know, we got to get along. The other, the other lady said, she's fine. She's sorry. You okay? And she says, yeah, I'm all right. She said, the last church I went to, I just didn't shake the pastor's hand. Well, if I didn't, I just, you know, I did, oh, my gosh. Let's start over. I'm not asking you to ignore her. <laughs> I'm asking you to embrace her. I'm asking you to forgive and to forget and, and have a new beginning. And she did. She did do it to her credit. Look at um, Psalms 119.11. And so remember, we're talking about the, the lost son that was at home. How many know that, that you can be in the church sometimes and you can serve? You, you can serve and serve and serve and serve. We're all serving Jesus Christ in here, right? I'm serving him right now, bringing the word that he's put in my spirit. But we're all serving. But you can, you can lose the... Um, the, the togetherness and the unity, you can lose the vision and the harmony that God wants us to. That's why I, I say, I don't, when someone helps in a church, they, the general term for that is ministry of helps. Ministry of helps. I don't like that term. Because you can help and not support. I like the term ministry of support. When you're serving in the church, no matter what capacity, you're doing it for the benefit of the church. In particular, supporting the office of the pastor, helping the, the, uh, the pastor um, run the show and do what the Holy Spirit asks us all to do. And you can have hardened hearts sometimes. Sometimes they can be your best workers. But there's, there's, there's problems in the heart. You know how you can find out if there's anything wrong in there? Ask them to do something they don't want to do. And you'll find out real quick. <laughs> what's going on in that heart. And so we have, to, we have to watch that, don't we? I have to watch it on my end. I have to watch how I relate to people and how I lead. And, and, and I must be Christ-like too, but look what David said in Psalms 119.11. He says, The word I have hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. Let's get that word down in there. Let's get it hid down in there. Let's know what the word says. Let's, let's re renew our minds with it. You don't have to turn there for time's sake, but Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. This is written to the Christians, right? You know what it means to be conformed to the world? To be molded and shaped and fashioned like the world. What happens when, when that? Well, you think like they think. And if you think like they think, you talk like they talk. And you're more of the world, its ways. This is written to Christians, right? He says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. That word transformed is the Greek word metamorpho, where we get the word metamorphosis. Let, let your mind undergo a metamorphosis, like a caterpillar to a butterfly. Just renewed in your thinking the whole way over. So it's don't, it says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
How do you renew, renew your mind? With the Word of God. And then it says when you do that, you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. There's a lot of Christians, they're like, where is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for my life? Where is it? I see it in other people's lives. Where is it? Where is it in my life? Well, it's right on the other side of not being conformed to the world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because he says that you may prove when you do that, you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God can, God can tell you all he wants, but if you're not renewed in your mind, you're not going to listen to him anyway. Right? I mean, but we should challenge ourselves. David said, he said, search me, O Lord, to see if there be a way in me. We should, we, uh, a way that's not pleasing. We should look into our heart and challenge ourselves to be pleasing to God always. But watch it in the homes. This is where my, my heart's really leaning towards tonight. Watch it in the homes and in the marriages. Don't drop your guard in there. That's where you need to be at your best. It's where you need to be your best. Amen? The Bible says that, that, that it talks about women, but men can do it too. It says that a woman can tear down her own home with her words. Tear it down. We don't want to tear down their homes, do we? We want to keep building for the glory of God. You don't want to get into strife and discord and, and all those things. Speak the word. Renew your mind to it. Hide it in your heart. Be quick to listen. In every encounter, quick to listen. I'm going to take it in this way. Be quick to listen to the Holy Spirit within you. He'll, he'll give you that prompting. You'll get that understanding. We all know what it's like, don't we, to, to think one way, but inside thinking, no, I shouldn't be thinking that. That's the battle. What cuts through the soul and the spirit? The Word. And so if you have the Word hid in your heart, if it's your treasure, then the Word will come out of your mouth, not, the, not what you were thinking up here. Right? That's all I have. Would you rise, please? So, you know, I believe this message is, you know, as all the messages are meant to, to, be, to, to be taken home and, and ponder over it and ask the Lord to show you and help you with things. If you feel you've hardened your heart in any area, the good thing about a heart change is you can change your heart in two seconds. All you need to do is just take it to the Lord. Amen? And He, he will forgive forgive and forget. He'll make it brand new. And then start, start with your words. Start saying what God says. Start saying the good words. And you'll see, uh, you'll see that great things will happen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this service tonight. I thank you, Lord, that we can um, be here with one another. And I thank you, Lord, that we will do that, Lord. We'll, we'll guard our heart. We'll watch what we say. We'll watch what we think. And as we do, Lord, we will prove your good and perfect will for our life, Father. Lord, I, I thank you for keeping everyone here safe and happy and healthy. I thank you for watching over their children, Lord, and their grandchildren. Thank you, Lord, for doing a special work in their lives, Lord God. May none of their children or grandchildren have a setback, Lord. May they only have positive things happening in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.